Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, welcome to the um, housing crisis in a time of democratic backsliding. And um, we have three panelists here today with us. Uh, first one is Natalie Koh, who is a professor of geography at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, and is currently a visiting fellow at IASS Postum. As a political geographer, she focuses on authoritarianism, citizenship, geopolitics, and state power, primarily in the Arabian Peninsula. She's the editor of the book, Specializing Authoritarianism, which I have a chapter in as well. And it will be released by Syracuse University Press in two weeks. And then we will uh, listen to Mariana, Mariana More. We really need to eat it up. Mariana More is a Brazilian urban planner and sociologist and co-founder of the Institute for collaborative urbanism and part of the Right to the City group. Uh, her experience covered the topics of participatory design, affordable housing and implementation of urban projects, particularly in Brazil, Colombia and Peru. And during 2020 and 2022, she worked as a German Chancellor Research Fellow at the Berlin Social Sciences Center to understand how to navigate between streets and institutions to co-design democratic urban policies, considering practices of consultation. Currently, she's a PhD student at the Technical University of Berlin and researcher at the German Institute for Risk Assessment. And lastly, we will have Lorena Zarate, an activist and organizer around housing rights and right to the city, founding member of the Global Platform for the Right to the City and part of its support team, former president of the Habitat International Co uh, Coalition between the years of 2011 and 2019 and coordinator of the Latin America office. And she has co-edited and published books and articles in Latin America, North America and Europe. Her academic training includes history, pedagogy and political economy. Born and raised in La Plata, Argentina. She's lived in Mexico City for 15 years and currently she resides in Ottawa, Canada. So we will start with Natalie. I'll just put... It is working. Okay, you hear me. You Good. You really need to put it really close. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right, we will, uh, we will find our way through all these technical difficulties uh, this morning. So thanks everyone for, for being here and for the invitation to be here. Um, it's, it's really a privilege and also just a chance to speak to you about the, the new book project that, that Ashigal just mentioned. Um, so the idea that I've been sort of tasked with is, is giving a, a more spatial sort of introduction to authoritarianism, but I, I suppose that for many people this, this isn't entirely novel. Um, Though it's a really common way of just uh, approaching authoritarianism is through the idea of the state. Like an entire huge block of territory is assumed to be an authoritarian um, yeah, country or context and everywhere else like within that space is, is imagined to be authoritarian. Obviously we know that within many of these places there's yeah, there, there's pockets of liberalism, and we also know that there's pockets of, of illiberalism in supposedly democratic countries. Uh, so the project that I've been working on in, in sort of pushing this uh, spatial approach to authoritarianism is to try to get beyond this, right? Um, to understand that authoritarianism is not just a block of territorial space, um, but that it's a worldview, a mindset, it's an ethic, and ultimately it's a set of practices, right? And a set of practices that don't necessarily have an essence, like it's, it's not really possible to say this is or isn't authoritarian because those practices are constantly shifting, right? Um, but overall, what I've, I've tried to conceptualize this as, as focusing on control, discipline, and univocal authority. Uh, so dissenting views are not necessarily yeah, tolerated in, in these sorts of, uh, sorts of contexts. Uh, so I won't go into it at, at any great length, but if people are interested, that's, um, that's the idea of, of the book at, that uh, Ashigal mentioned. 
I just want to focus a little bit on the idea of discipline, uh, because this, this is one of the more important uh, authoritarian practices, I think, that, that we can discern in urban contexts, um, but obviously at, at many different scales. So um, Michel Foucault, the French uh, theorist, sort of talks about this through, uh, through looking at the example of Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, where if people don't know this already, you sort of have this idea of at the center of the prison, there is a guard, and then and the prisoners are sort of in each of these cells. And with discipline, you have this like ability to sort of control people through just knowing that they might be subjected to the guard's gaze. Uh, and so they internalize that control in a lot of ways. Uh, so discipline happens in, in that sort of structure of relationships that is happening, but it's also the disciplining of space. Right, like you're controlling and you're spatially coordinating uh, a structure such that people are internalizing that control and you're also able to exert that on them. So you can see this in, in lots of different ways in terms of housing and the, the, the sort of broader state scale, but also at the, at the urban scale. Um, so here, yeah, I think you can, you can certainly have seen this in the way that Soviet urban planners thought about space on the structuring of space and the construction of good Soviet citizens, also in, in East Germany, a similar kind of spatial planning and urban planning was, was important to, to this logic. Um, it was a disciplinary logic in many ways, um, which means that it was, it was in some ways top down, but it was also bottom up. I want to actually focus my sort of contributions today because I think our other speakers will have much more to say about the contemporary issues um, on this idea uh, that, that goes hand in hand with uh, housing and disciplinary control in in these sort of state systems uh, specifically household registration system so some of you may know this as the hukou system in in China uh, or during the Soviet Union the the propiska system um, which yeah it was essentially a way of governing where people lived, and then their their housing had to be attached to where their their uh, permission, their their residency was registered. Uh, so this is the, this is something that was very powerful in controlling people's movement during communist times and continues to be uh, in in many parts of the world. So certainly in, in other places where I've done a lot of my research in the past, in Central Asia, primarily in Kazakhstan, uh, you still have this sort of propiska system. It's been reconfigured, uh, but it's, it's essentially uh, a continued obligation to register your residence and your rights and entitlements are attached to where your, uh, where your residency is. Um, where it is legally registered. So these countries in Central Asia still have this. And it's been a, a point of contest, continues to be a point of contest for, uh, for, for many of these regions, including Kazakhstan, where you've had uh, new sort of household registration requirements and people, if they change their residence, this, this big protests erupted in 2017 because people were required to register their residence uh, if they moved within the country and expected to stay somewhere for more than one month. Um, and so it was something that the state was justifying as preventing terrorism. Um, and uh, people from the bottom up were saying, no, look, like this runs counter to Kazakh lifestyle and Kazakh understanding of sociality and family and kinship. Uh, and, and this is a state intrusion on that. But the it's, it's important here, I think, just to emphasize on this issue of housing, that state control is being exerted on and through the mechanism of housing. And it's landlords that are being uh, used as this intermediary of the state power. The landlords have to, have to control who is or isn't registered. And if they don't, they are also subject to fines and control from, from the state. So these kinds of bureaucratic tools function through the sort of capillary power uh, that, that Foucault talks about in, in discipline. It functions through those landlords and other sorts of yeah, housing, housing spaces. 
This is something that has also been talked about at great length in, in China with the hukou system, because after um, the the sort of breakup of a lot of um, a lot of the state policies that kept people attached to land and rural rural areas, uh, you had this loosening of agrarian uh, structures in society, and so you had huge migration of people to the cities, but they didn't deregulate the the registration system that attached people to their rural uh, residency. So to get a residency permit in the cities was very difficult. And as, as in Kazakhstan, in China, if you don't have that permission to register your residence in this new location, you're excluded from a huge range of services, right? Uh, and this, is, uh, this then also becomes a sort of authoritarian tactic of controlling people's movement, but also controlling their access to social benefits that other people might have. Uh, and so this, this has been a, a major point of, of contest of trying to get people to, uh, trying to get the Chinese government to, to reform uh, the, the hukou system. So I want to always, in, in all of my work on authoritarianism, I always try to come back to how you actually see what is happening in countries that we could generally agree would be considered authoritarian, China or, or Kazakhstan or Turkmenistan, that you see very similar patterns in the supposed liberal democracies, right? And I, I sort of came to this topic because I am in the process of moving to Germany and like was <laughs> dealing with this whole household registration, this registration system in Germany in, in March, just as all of the Ukrainian refugees were also arriving. And you could you could not you could not register. Um, it was impossible. I'm living in Potsdam right now. It was impossible to get uh, one of these registration appointments. And it was like this state of complete terror. <laughs> you, what do you do if you are now all of a sudden violating the law uh, because you cannot register and your landlord wants to help you, but they can't because they can't change the city registration rules. So there's this sort of sense of of terror that comes with being in violation of the, the registration requirements. And for, for many people then, this is attached to, can you get a cell phone? Can you open a bank account? Can you do anything? It's all attached to that registration, right? And this is again how that, the, those sort of social services are being mediated through the registration system. Um, then I also heard, as, as I was sort of personally dealing with all this anxiety, I, I heard the story of, of this Belgian man, uh, or a man in Belgium, Algerian man, uh, who had won the Belgian lottery. Did anybody hear this story? <laughs> all right, so he won, a, he won this lottery in, in Belgium uh, for 250,000 euros. But he could not take the money because he was not, a doc, like he was not documented in, in Belgium. He had not been able to register his residence there. He wasn't able to open a bank account. He wasn't able to do any of these things to take the money from the lottery. Uh, and so it was this system of registration, of housing registration that was excluding him. Um, and I think that this is really important then again to reflect how these authoritarian practices actually exist within supposedly liberal democratic societies. That in some countries and some contexts, you have have the same idea of controlling people's movement that is being applied domestically to citizens within that country. And yes, in Germany and Belgium, those those rules apply to, to the, the people who have that nationality. But where it's felt the most severe and where it feels like a, a sort of authoritarian set of practices is where it gets applied selectively. And selectively in this particular case to migrants who don't have access to the legal uh, certainty that comes with, uh, with, with that registration system. Uh, so just to, to sort of wrap up, I mean, I think these are, these are some of the ways that you start to see how those authoritarian practices and spatializing authoritarianism like helps to bring our attention to, uh, to, to a broader set of, of, set of ways of thinking about authoritarianism. Um, but also just the, 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 
the way that uncertainty and precarity actually is experienced as a kind of authoritarian like practice for some people, right? If you cannot plan, you cannot decide, you cannot get a bank account, you cannot uh, access your money in a particular way, all of these forms of uncertainty and precarity are also then experienced as a kind of authoritarian exclusion, but also an authoritarian disciplining of our movements and our bodies bodies and, and our ways of, of getting through space in daily life. Um, and I think this just sort of comes back to that fantasy of equality of the liberal script <laughs> often uh, that, yes, this household registration laws in Kazakhstan, China or Germany, they apply to everybody, right? Yes, but at the same time, everybody is not equal. Uh, and so there's different bodies and there's different migration statuses and there's different issues related to disability for example, uh, that that come into uh, come into this conversation in different ways. Uh, so I think that when when we think about housing and access to housing, the the actual like materiality of where your living space. It's part of this bigger architecture of bureaucratic control. And I think it's there that that we also have to focus our attention um, through things like the the household registration system. So I will leave it there. Hope I didn't talk too long. Thanks. Uh, I will just now change the presentation to Mariana and we'll talk about hopefully Berlin this time. I was not sure if I would share this video because I was thinking that maybe we could have people uh, know German, but I think it would be nice also. So yeah, yeah can you put yeah? Great. Just one minute. I think everyone. I'm sure actually everyone would like uh, have heard about the campaign, but I think it's a good uh, I don't know way to start just to feel a bit the topic as well. And thank you, thank you everyone for being here. I'm really happy to see everyone. And also for me, it's particularly okay, I'm understanding because I'm from Brazil, so I'm also like understanding. Uh, and I also would like to share a bit of my country, but now I'm talking about Germany. Germany also like the views in uh, my views, like in Berlin, so it's a lot of contradictions for me as well. And okay, we can start. We live all together in this city. Wir helfen uns, lachen miteinander und gehen uns auch mal auf die Nerven. Aber kann ich mein Leben in Berlin wirklich so gestalten, wie ich es möchte? Bin ich selber schuld, wenn ich keine bezahlbare Wohnung mehr finde? Muss ich mich damit abfinden, dass ich mir mein Zuhause nicht mehr leisten kann? Muss ich einfach wegziehen, wenn es hier immer, immer teurer wird? Nein. 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 Denn unser Zuhause ist kein Spekulationsobjekt. Es ist genau hier, 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 hier und hier. Meine Familie lebt hier in Lichtenberg seit fast 300 Jahren. Nur meine Nachbarn ertragen meine laute Musik. Weil hier alles gut erreichbar ist. Und ich möchte nicht immer mehr Geld für meine Miete ausgeben. Unser Kiez ist doch keine Aktie. Wir sind unser Kiez. Und gemeinsam können wir das auch bleiben. In Marienfelde. In Friedrichshain. In Reinickendorf. In Marzahn. Unsere Unterschiede machen diese Stadt aus. Aber jetzt müssen wir zusammenhalten. Denn hier ist unser Zuhause. Und hier wollen wir nicht weg. Weil es unsere Stadt ist. Weil es unsere Zukunft ist. Damit Berlin unser Zuhause bleibt. Für ein Berlin mit bezahlbaren Mieten für alle. Wir haben die Wahl. Am 26.09. Ja, damit Berlin unser Zuhause bleibt. Thank you. Uh, so I, I decided to start with this video because I think I can see myself some, somehow like in, in the people that are like shot in this film. So I think it's a nice way to start. And as you said, as you like, could see, this uh, was like a, um, 
is about like this campaign that like uh, in the moment of the the video was like uh, shot in September last uh, last year. So just to have like some background somehow, I think the topic of, of housing, the discussion of housing in Berlin is not new, right? And I'm sure uh, you somehow experienced that, as also Anatoly said, right? So this, these protests happened in 1992. So we by Ben Ali, so uh, all, we all stay here, right? And for me, this is very important because uh, somehow this contextualizes the relation of the reunification of, uh, of Berlin this, in, in this moment, right? So in the period of uh, uh, when somehow we start to, to see, okay, so how like two, two models start to be together, how uh, this like uh, east part of Berlin uh, in which we had a, a, a huge Public stock of housings, it started like to be uh, to change the ownership of this uh, of the housing. So we started like to to have private owner ownership um, after the reunification, right? So we start to lose somehow the the public stock, and a lot of companies start, of course, to buy as, as well this this stock. So uh, uh, we have the decreasement of the public stock of housing, right? So this is important because when we see Berlin now, and here I'm just like bringing this map where we can see uh, the percentage of rental apartments on the total stock of uh, houses. And we can see, for example, in the, in the south and also like in some cities in the north, we have like more than 70% uh, of uh, like uh, rental apartments, right? And Berlin uh, now has uh, 8% of rental apartments on total stock. In them. So we can, we can see somehow how um, the ownership and also, like as Nelson and Natalia said, uh, also the, the relation that like to access housing is that like to be on the control of private uh, landlords when we have also the situation, right? And also have this fact that in the last decade we have 100% of increase of uh, the rents of the price. So how is start like this thing and why uh, when I arrived here I'm always uh, I was always like I uh, have uh, heard in that like Berlin is a city of tenants and I was like why and uh, coming also from Brazil what 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 does this number uh, really like means and then we, we have like this also this information we can feel somehow the situation right so this campaign started like three years ago and I think uh, yesterday we also uh, you also could like uh, heard about this right so but what I'm bringing now is that this um, when we have this kind of ways to claim for affordable housings um, we have different ways to claim for affordable houses this is not a new topic but at the same time I think we have like some lessons or some thoughts about this campaign is specifically when I'm talking about practice of uh, contestation right so um, and for me one main side somehow is that how we can navigate between streets and institutions how we can uh, use and apply all the the tools that we have related to formal procedures of participation like for, as for example direct voting as, as a petition as a referendum or a representative space or deliberative space how we can make somehow or combine these these types with also some the tools and the the strategies that we also use in like in grassroots organizations right so I think in this campaign we can have like a the in, in the whole process a lot of combinations of all this uh, dimension this, this multi dimension of participation uh, in, in the city, right? So here we can also see uh, that, okay, so we have a lot of instruments and we can also, when we have some formal procedures as a referendum, for example, we also have a lot of barriers related to uh, institutional ways to participate in the city, right? So here I'm just like bringing that, okay, so we can see that um, as, for example, myself and also we don't have German passport, so how we can also participate in a formal way, right? So I think one main claim of the Right to the City uh, group from Deutsche Bahn uh, campaign is that like uh, voting rights are not a separate issue 
from housing just they are uh, they are really connected like the this demand with all the discrimination and all the barriers that we have for example natalie also said uh with access like uh, when we don't have uh, the access uh housing or then to vote, to participate in formal procedures, we also start like to have a lot of injustice and discriminations and a lot of things. And uh, I remember, for example, uh, when I, I was doing the inter uh, my research, I also like uh, had interviewed many tenants. And for example, um, a black tenant said for me, "Okay, Mariana, uh, when I have, I, I need to have like some interviews. We uh, when uh, I need like okay, so I have a, a, a lot of like appointments, a lot of interviews to to get my apartment. But when I ha I will do like I will go to the interview, I ask I just I need to ask for a white friend because uh, some people don't want to to have like black people living in their apartment. So um, voting rights and uh, the way that we access the the formal procedures are they also matter, right? So. And, uh, we are like uh, Berlin is an international city as well. Like in five Berliners, one is not German. So how can somehow navigate between these both uh, layers and institutions and space to to participate here? And something that for me is also when we start to highlight and to see these barriers to participate, for me is really important also to 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 highlight how, okay, so we have these different ways to participate, okay, pro protests, occupation of public space, um, petition, and also, also for me, for example, how this campaign really like occupy the city in the sense of, okay, so how we can mobilize different neighborhoods, how we can um, integrate like uh, small services in, in neighborhoods, but also institutions, but also schools, but also like, uh, the whole uh, and somehow like the different like uh, spheres uh, of uh, of the society. So okay, so we can have the diversity of this, but the same. So if you ha are if we are uh, activating somehow all these publics, we also need to have like different arguments and different uh, ways to talk to to advance. So something that for me is really important is the, this proactive use of legislation for this strong mobilization. So how we can use, for example, I think, uh, the Article 15 actually, uh, they use this uh, socialization that is already in the basic, uh, basic law in the constitution, right? The German constitution. But we can also use some uh, political slogan to, to, to achieve and to reach out some of these groups. So the idea of uh, socialization, to dialogue somehow with the institutions, but also expropriation to have like these um, more people related to the topic, right? So, and another strategy that for me is also uh, is also important. For example, is when okay, so we have we cannot vote as an immigrant. So, how we can collect and expose these barriers? So, for example, with the political signature during the the, the petition, the first the, the petition, and also the the campaign for the referendum. Uh, so immigrants cannot vote. So, but can they can sign um, this? Uh, this petition to ask for the, to to be agreeing and to demand the, the expropriation. So this number just means that okay. So it's not like just the valid votes, but we also have like this huge number that, uh, including people who cannot vote. And I also I think this is also uh, somehow is some insight or some uh, something that we can discuss. That okay. So we can. We don't need. Uh, uh, we can have a lot of different forms to to participate, right? And sometimes the language is a barrier. Okay, so uh, even uh, in, during the campaign, like to dialogue with members and to to really uh, be part of this group is also uh, like we have the German barrier. So how we can also participate in different ways? So for example, the right to the city group also. Uh, uh, started like okay, so let's do a team leading. Let's do a group that we can like express ourselves differently. And for me, that is like a, something in this movement that is okay. So now, uh, previously, that it started like the team leading. It is started like to be okay. This is cool. This okay. This is somehow uh, called the attention, right? And then with like uh, the results of the referendum. Uh, when we are seeing like the all the newspapers, we have a lot of like uh, 
pictures from the right to the city group, from the digital leading. So how we can uh, move from, okay, from somehow some, not marginalize it, but uh, like a, uh, out of the center of the main discussion to somehow like, a, okay, now we are in the newspaper. So how, what this represents, right? And as I said, like this process of, okay, different uh, working groups talking in different languages, not just thinking about German and English, but also with Bais and Turkish and a lot of uh, forms of expression. And here's just to, to bring this idea, okay, so voting, uh, direct voting, and we are also thinking about deliberative sometimes and also uh, representative forms of participation sometimes we just see as like an, an event. Okay, this is like a, a meeting of a, a citizen council, for example, or this is just like the elections and how we can really use this repertoire of uh, grassroots movements to extend and to amplify the forms of participation instead of like a yes or no event, right? And just to, like, uh, to conclude, uh, I'm also bringing this that is uh, really the communication, the, the way that like uh, Right to the City and the Deutsche Bundling campaign uh, use a lot of humor in the communication, right? And what this means, I think the humor somehow can also help us to, to expose some, some, some things and also to, to help us to create some imaginaries that sometimes is difficult for us to access. And when we have, okay, let's maybe socialize everything, how, how this really like catch, how this like uh, um, mobilize and, and uh, help us to create like these imaginaries, right? And just uh, bring this, uh, this quote from Murabi that, okay, although success and flair are uh, usually seen through a lens of short term political gains, but protests often uh, occur in cycles. So, okay, we have more than 1 million of people who voted yes for expropriation. Uh, this not means that the Senate needs to implement this law because it's not binding, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's a, a huge expression. So they, don't not, they cannot just like, okay, ignore this, this information. So of course, need, uh, change the housing law needs to be done, right? Uh, but at the same time, yes, this is a process. Uh, 30 years ago, if the uh, all all of us stay in Berlin, uh, like the, the protests already, already somehow uh, demonstrated that, right? This is a process and this is like uh, needs to be continued and I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think now we can move on to the last presentation of panelists for today, so Lorena, who will take us all over the world, but mostly to Global South, I think. I think I'm ready. <laughs> Hello, hi, good morning, buenos dias. Um, everyone, thank you very much for the invitation to Doris and the Rosa Luxemburg. And thank you to you all for being here today. Um, basically, what I wanted to share with you today, and I'm very grateful to having this opportunity, is some of the work we have been doing through or with different organizations um, in different parts of the world. In particular, in this case, uh, some of the experiences coming from Latin America. And those two organizations are the ones uh, I've been more involved with for the past 20 plus years. Uh, they have the International Coalition and more recently the Global Platform for the Right to the City. Those two are international organizations and they work kind of in a federated way. Um, so they are built from existing organizations, so putting them together and being social movements, housing cooperatives, community and grassroots organizations of different sizes, but also people from the academia, students, researchers, professors, professionals, and so on. So like this broad like civil society kind of term. And, and within this, and this organization has um, 
this coalition has organizations in around 120 countries now. Um, and the global platform for the right to the city is a different kind of a space. It's not an organization, it's not a coalition, uh, but it's more like a political space of existing, not just organizations, but networks in this case. So it's kind of a network of networks, something like that. Uh, so a political space for joint action. And in that case, it's not just the broad civil society, but also local governments and progressive local governments and networks of local governments. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the, at the end, but, and why that is important for us. Um, so basically, three main topics or issues. Uh, they're kind of chronological or different phases, but also kind of overlapping and kind of different dimensions. So the first one, uh, I want to point out something that might be evident and obvious for many people, but not so much for others. Uh, there is a parallel trajectory of urbanization process and the democratization of the fight for democracy uh, in many Latin American countries. Uh, the second one is the process of democratization, but under the imposition of the neoliberal agenda. So they, they come together. And finally, a more uh, contemporaneous you know, approach to that will be the relevance of the right to the city in the contemporary era, and in particular after or during the, the COVID uh, crisis and the neo-authoritarian wave. Um, I'm post-neoliberal, some will say. Um, so the first one, the, the urbanization process in Latin America started around 40s and 50s and lasted for 30 years, more or less. That was kind of the peak of the urbanization process. Of course, I'm generalizing with different uh, dynamics and different speeds, et cetera, in different countries. Um, and more or less link what was called the import substitution process. So the, the incipient development um, of uh, local and uh, national industries. Um, so that generated a, a huge migration, basically from the countryside to the urban centers. And as it is the case today, usually the um, economic policy is not really linked with the housing policy. So we still see these, you know, like new developments and new investment, you know, here and there, but they're not usually related with, with a housing policy and a land policy. So you will have eventually some job offers, but you don't have affordable housing for the people that are going to take those jobs. And that was the case back then, of course. So basically what you have is huge occupations and invasions of land um, in general in the periphery, so-called periphery of the cities, but not only. We can also see that in particular in the first waves, was also in the city centers. Um, and of course, a huge um, gender component, gender dimension of this. Um, at least half of those people were women. Um, and in many cases, they were, and still are, the, the community leaders, they were the ones taking care of the social and community work. Uh, so a kind of a triple day work, not just uh, the double work uh, shift that the feminists usually talk about, but in this case is a triple uh, shift, including the, the, the work at the community level. So, and of course, a huge ra racial component too, uh, that in Latin America is very hidden, is very, um, you know, it's not explicit, uh, it's not very talked about and discussed about, it's, that is changing, I think, uh, and in particular in places like Brazil or Colombia, where there's huge mobilization, and of course in the Caribbean and, and some places in Central America, but it's a huge topic and a huge reality um, that we need to uh, address in a more explicit way, including this inside the social movements. Um, so basically, when we're talking about this period, uh, you know, the 50s and the 80s, in most Latin American countries, there was a period of authoritarianism, and in many countries, explicit uh, dictatorships. So not just authoritarian regimes, but dictatorships, and very violent dictatorships. As, as Natalie was explaining, there was not only political discipline and um, you know, a lot of restrictions and control, but also urban planning. And in this case, uh, that's a, a huge highway in, in Buenos Aires, um, and the Villa, Villa 31 in Buenos Aires are very centrally located. That they started that one, like uh, Villa Unemployment, basically in the 30s, and developed a huge neighborhood in the city center. And one of the first strong fights 
for that neighborhood was actually against the building, uh, the construction of this highway. And, and it's interesting because at that time you can see some parallels in other cities also that are um, contesting the, the building of some such infrastructures. In this case, there was cutting through the villa, cutting through the neighborhood, and even though it was a, a dictatorship, people were organizing and were actually actively opposing that under huge risk. So we're talking about killings and you know disappearance and etc. And this was um, highly um, affecting organizations at this level, and not only the communities there, but also all the alliances and the allies they had that they were and are a lot of different people um, from from different sectors. So and but we also had um, so not just resistance, but also the the construction of alternative imaginaries uh, and also alternative um, processes and housing solutions. So the FUGVAM is a very well known in Latin America federation of mutual uh, uh, self-help or mutual aid cooperatives, housing cooperatives uh, in Uruguay um, that was born out of the, um, the um, a process of a national law, the first national law in Latin America explicitly uh, dealing with housing cooperatives in 1968, so it's very early. And from then, that has inspired housing cooperatives and movements in different countries, uh, first in the southern cone, and so in, in Argentina um, and Brazil, uh, but also from there moved all over the region and including a, a more yeah, recent uh, federation of cooperatives in Central America um, that is directly inspired by this um, movement. So. And I think this part is important too, because usually when we talk about authoritarianism and you know disciplinary power, etc., we talk and we discuss a lot about resistance, right? And organizing and resisting and confronting. But then, what's the space for actually building alternatives? And in this case, very explicit socialist alternatives and, and you know community-based and communitarian alternatives. So the housing movements when they are organize and get some kind of support in terms of access to land, access to proper financing, technical support, etc. They can build these beautiful houses uh, through self-help and, and, and so on, and, and mobilizing local resources. And it's not just housing, it's, it's building communities and building all the facilities you need for that. And, and if we track that back from the 60s and the 70s in Latin America, there were these movements were talking about building people's power or poder popular. So it's, it's creating alternatives, uh, you know, communities, alternative communities that will um, try to address all the spheres of life and, and not just housing in a, in a very in interconnected way. And many of these, these pictures are from different places actually. Some of those are from Uruguay, some others are from Mexico, some others are from Brazil. Um, so, and they are, they are quite recent pictures. So they're still um, very much alive and, and you know, replicating in other place, places. The second one, I'm, I'm going quickly through this, but this is, uh, so that fight for democratization was also the right for, for you know, a fight for rights and not just political rights, but social rights and in particular housing and land rights and the right to stay, to be in the city and to stay in the city and to be part of the city. Um, eventually that in the 90s, you know, the end of the dictatorships and the you know, recovery of some level of democracy, that was at the same time of the imposition of the neoliberal agenda. So we got, we got very weak version of democracy um, and kind of a liquidation of rights or, or very um, small doses of rights, you know, here and there. Some of those struggles uh, managed to get some uh, funding for improvement programs of self-built neighborhoods. So we're talking about huge areas in our cities and actually in Latin America around half of the cities that you see built have been built by the people over time. So not the market, not the state. And in some cases that, you know, one quarter in some places that's two thirds in, in some cities, but on average it's more or less half the, half the city. So those programs act, they actually put some funding, public funding into the you know, improvement, the improvement of those, of those neighborhoods. Um, 
mostly through these kind of projects, you know, like um, public art and murals and graffitis, working with youth and so on, but also infrastructure, community centers, that orange thing there is the subway, access to subway and the, and the funicular, etc., to connect the neighborhoods that are very high on the hills to the city center and so on, internet connection. All that is, is very important, of course. Uh, but actually that didn't come with uh, you know, more possibilities for jobs and employment and more access to higher education and so on and so forth. So it's kind of disconnected. And some level of participation in some of the projects, but again, very, you know, very weak um, and not the kind of participation we want. But at the same time, the problem is that was just some of the neighbors, some of the, the policies. At the same time, we got the imposition of the neoliberal agenda, again, from a um, housing and a spatial point of view. We know there was you know, massive construction of housing, private housing on the outskirts of the cities, uh, a lot of new developments and luxury developments in many, many cities. Uh, and we can see that here in Berlin too, of course. This is since the late uh, 90s and beginning of 2000s. Uh, so a lot of um, um, speculation, of course, going on and rising of homelessness population uh, all over, the, all over the, the region again. And a lot of empty houses, uh, both old and new, and, and very difficult to address that topic. You know, when, when you discuss housing issues with politicians or the media, they always fix on the deficit and is the quantitative deficit. So how many more houses we need to build to address the problem? So the first issue for housing activists is like, no, 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 that's not the problem. Let's reframe the problem. The problem is different. So the solutions are also different. And of course, huge inequality, rising, rising inequality uh, during the 90s and the 2000s, and you can see that reflected in the space, right? Uh, and these are you know, very luxury condominiums on the one side and self-built uh, self neighborhoods on the other. Um, so lack of infrastructure, lack of green, green spaces, and lack of opportunities, of course. And again, you know, the coming back of the militarization and the, and the very explicit, explicitly authoritarian policies in these neighborhoods in particular uh, under so-called democratic and, and you know elected democratically elected governments in, in the region. Uh, this is from, from the favelas in Brazil, but we can see that in, in many, many different places, Some, sometimes with explicit military presence, and sometimes it's more like hidden, right? But it's very, very authoritarian practices. And finally, because I'm sure I'm over time, almost, two, three more minutes, yeah. <laughs> Um, of course, the COVID, the COVID crisis came, and, and the COVID crisis, we know, affected everyone, but in, of course, in different ways, and different, not only different sectors of the population, but the places you live and the way you live in, in, in those neighborhoods, right? So we know that overall, racialized communities, migrants, and low-income communities were disproportionately affected by the pandemic, but also in these neighborhoods, right? Um, so they were the first to be affected and, and you know, were more deaths at the beginning and so on. And they're claiming we're also essential, right? And so organizing and providing in particular food, so health was an issue, but food was the most pressing, uh, pressing issue because people usually work in the so-called informal economy. So when you have the economy shut down and every work, working from home, these people cannot work from home. Uh, and they rely on daily incomes. So basically food and access to food was the main issue. So we have seen the, you know, the explosion of, of, of community kitchens and soup kitchens all over uh, the, the region again, and claiming we are essentials. So we should be treated as essentials, essential too. And we did one of the many mappings of those initiatives that you know, different organizations made uh, around the world to show that ability and, and organizing power of different communities. And we also saw some policies um, at the different level, a lot of policies, of course, but these in particular focusing on the housing issues, um, basic income, uh, access to services, and so on. And, and we know that most of those measures were actually taken at the so-called sub-national level. So only a third of those measures were taken by national governments. But many of those temporary but quite progressive measures were taken by the city level, sub-district level, and or the, the regional provincial level. And, and that's very important and very telling, I think. And also more related with the pressure and the 
organization and collaboration with civil society at that level. So you can see, and for sure you know more, you know, from rent freeze, moratoria on evictions, uh, shelter and food provision, repurposing of public and private infrastructures and facilities, and this is crucial, right? And even in Toronto right now, the, actually the city government bought some of the empty hotels during the pandemic, and they're transforming that into, into affordable housing and, and shelters and so on. So it's possible, and, and we know that there are you know, discussions in other places to do that. Um, basic income, gender violence, of course, that was on the rise all over the world, including in Latin America during the pandemic. Regularization of migrants too. In some cities and some countries did this you know, massive regularization of, of um, migrants. So this is the final one. Just to put that out there, and we can discuss that more uh, later on, but for us, this coming together of the right to the city agenda that has been on the table and you know, on, on the agenda for the movements for a long time now, for decades, coming together with a so-called new municipalism and progressive local governments, usually coming not from traditional parties, but from citizens' parties. And, and we see that as a very powerful you know, uh, convergence of agendas. And sometimes it's explicit, that convergence, and sometimes it's not. But they're relying on, on different topics, including the reframing of citizenship. And this is something that both um, Natalie and Mariana was talking about. Uh, so this relationship of the place where we live and the political rights. Uh, so detaching that from the national level and from the legal status of people, but actually attaching that to the place of, of residence in a good way. Um, so that's, that's crucial, but also going together, of course, with the radicalization of democracy at the direct level, you know, community level, and so on. So we can discuss that more, but that's, and everything is, um, I want to do an homenaje um, to Mariel Franco, a uh, um, great activist in, in Brazil from Rio de Janeiro that was actually assassinated four years ago because of her activism um, related to favelas, but also uh, gay and LGBT rights um, in, in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. It was really amazing. And I'm just going to talk about all of the presentations and a little bit about the Gizzi Park protest to close it. And to start with Natalie, actually, it's a, as the research group of IRGAC, we usually all the time discuss what authoritarianism is, how it, how it presents itself in the political arena and everything. And I think when we come to urban planning or space, it's um, interesting and amazing to see that authoritarianism does not exist as a notion, but it's a set of practices that goes from the south to north to and everywhere. So it's not like something that we can really uh, attribute to a regime. And it was really interesting that the, you talked about the exclusions and the voting rights and how there are barriers to housing and access to housing, which reminds me actually the case of Vienna, where social housing is completely restricted to Viennese citizens and that requires two years of Viennese residency to be able to access housing. And that it even shows like in many other places in the global north and including the um, usual suspects of authoritarian regime that how it can present itself. And I remember the people from the Vienna municipality were actually asking themselves like, we don't understand we have the best social housing in the world. We are the biggest landlords of Europe. And how come we have homeless people? And I wonder why, because they can't access social housing at all. Um, and that actually uh, brings me to how important legal geography is in a way, and brings me to the Berlin case uh, with Mariana, the, the DWE, because I think before, or I mean still, legal geography and is used against housing rights and housing justice all around the world. It was the case, including in Berlin, especially after the fall of the wall, where everything was privatized in the east of Berlin, and they were just like sold for almost nickels. Um, 
I think what GWE did was just they reversed that process of legal geography, which is very exclusionary when it comes to lawsuits and politicians and policymakers. And they tried to bring it to the people, which is where it belongs when it comes to uh, legality of urban planning. Uh, especially because it actually affects the people and not the politicians or the lawyers that are fighting for those, fighting for the uh, private sector. Um, it's also amazing how they try to still, because I know uh, DW is still in the negotiation process, though they don't want to negotiate as far as I know, but hopefully they won't have to. Um, what happened, I remember, in Warsaw was the complete opposite for with the reprivatization process that they took away the houses, of, houses from the people of Polish people who were living there since the 70s or the 60s uh, based on the fact that the uh, fall of communism and that those places should belong to, should go to go back to their rightful owners who used to live there in the 30s or 20s or something like that. So I think it just like shows how important it is to resist these kind of exclusionary practices through the legal arena as well. And I think when we, when as it happened in Berlin, when people organize in a way that's probably quite exhausting, but organize in a way that's uh, communicative, it is, it's possible to penetrate these squares that seems somewhat impossible to penetrate from an average citizen point of view. Um, lastly, uh, if I would comment on uh, Lorena's presentation, thank you so much, it was very interesting. And I think the only comment slash question I have, and I think we were talking about it yesterday too, was the um, difference between right to the city and right to housing, and which one would be more practical in terms of mobilization and for urban struggles. Because I see that I understand right to housing is much more, abstract and maybe more inclusive when it comes to mobilizing globally. But at the same time, the fact that it's so abstract maybe um, presents some obstacles for alternatives. So would you think that maybe it's better or it is more practical to use right to housing as a way to organize resistance to these uh, exclusionary practices in the urban arena? That will be, but apart from that, it's uh, it was great. And I have to add that in in Turkey, we usually use right to housing as opposed, uh, sorry, right to the city as opposed to right to housing. But that usually because um, the housing market is incredibly exclusionary, and uh, selling and buying a house is considered as a right that should exist above everything rather than having a shelter. So they, uh, the activists use right to the city as a way to include more people without harming the landlords. So, so I, I'm really interested to know your, uh, your uh, comments on that. And if we start with this, I would like to close with this because these are the uh, posters from the Chamber of Architects in Istanbul and Chamber of Urban Planners in Istanbul as well. And they're depicting three people who were recently jailed for 18 years, uh, along with the um, Kavala case. Maybe some of you heard of it. They were um, jailed because of, the, because of their assistance to Kavala in the Gezi, right, uh, Gezi Park protest. And what's important is that these three people, and especially Mücella Yapıcı in between, who's 72 years old, is a very important figure in Istanbul and in Turkey for housing justice and for urban struggles since the late 1980s. She's been in the forefront on most of the um, urban struggles and housing justice struggles, uh, especially since the uh, early 2000s. And they were jailed to overthrow the government and annihilate the state itself as well without I think almost any evidence, and I, I would like to present that because this happened all, uh, two weeks ago, and I think it shows quite well how authoritarian practices clash with urban struggles and, um, and uh, um, the uh, profit-making systems in the neoliberal urban space of Istanbul and Turkey. And I think, yeah, that's another one as well, which uh, says that we were all in Gezi, so we should all be jailed in that case. Um, and I would like to close with a small um, 
video and I will just like open it. This was taken right after the announcement of the decision of the court that they just found out that they were going to jail for 18 years. And you can see all three of them. And you will just hear John Atalay, which is, was the lawyer of the uh, Chamber of Architects. And he, there, there are no subtitles, so he will be saying, we won't bow down to persecution, we won't bow down to cruelty. Let me just put that on. Burada bizi Mücella ablamızı Bakırköy'e ihtimalen bizi Silivri'ye götürecekler. Şunu bilin, şunu bilin. Zulme boyu eğmeyeceğiz. Zulme karşı direneceğiz. Şunu bilin, şunu bilin. Şunu bilin. Hiçbir hukukta aykırı işleri kabul etmeyeceğiz. Elle gelen düğün bayram hani burada ise aşırı burada. Nereye alıyorsun? Thank you. And we can take any questions and comments that you have about any presentations right now. Yeah, um, does it work? Uh, thank you. Um, it was really, really cool. It was really, really nice also to have it after the boat tour, I think, yesterday, because it really connects well. And I mean, for me, uh, also these struggles, the spatial struggles are really an essence of authoritarianism and these practices. So that really made sense to me. And I had to think a lot about uh, this um, Leonard Feldman's reply to Nancy Fraser of like the domination that is inherent in state spatial rule, which I think really connects well to, to here. Um, and uh, this, like, I think that um, this DVE campaign and the registration um, presentation together really like clicked for me or worked well because, like, what I'm always interested in or what I see is like that these state authoritarian disciplinary practices somehow are always utilized by capital. So they really are accessible for the capitalist classes and they always work so well together. And with the reg registration practice in Germany, it's actually the same case because. On the one hand, it's a disciplinary practice, and it's also telling like citizens that like the state can always find you and always send you threatening letters with whatever. But um, which, which they do as well, like in about like two months um, uh, um, distances. But also, like this practice in Berlin is like one of the biggest factors um, of why people lose their flats, um, and they can be adverse because there's like these these gaps in the legislation that if you yeah, like you can sublet for longer times. Um, so if you do that, then the, like um, illegally, then the, like the contract can be um, unruled and then they can do a new contract with higher rents, of course, you know, all that stuff. But that is why people can't register anymore in their flats and they have to register somewhere else or they're unregistered, like also German citizens. Um, quite a lot and it really creates a lot of problems and it really serves the interest of this capital capitalist uh, these uh, um, this registration system so i th i found it very interesting to, to be together um yeah i mean yeah i don't really have a yeah thank you <laughs> yeah. i also have a comment and also i think a question i also found like very very great panel thanks to all of you i think it is connected uh, fantastically um, yeah and I was um, I was thinking about about what you what we've been talking about about the period of like uh, democratization and um, um, like neoliberal neoliberalization and how um, like practices disciplinary practices authoritarian practices kind of um, uh, trickled down no, to another level, which I think is something that I would I would like to ask because I think it connects to several of what you've been saying. Like with a moment where, like um, especially Latin America, which I know best, like uh, dictatorships, or there was a transitioning period, 
And then in a way, what, what was happening there, you know, because I feel that there's like a kind of outsourcing of violence against popular classes in a way, no? Um, to subnational, um, like maybe to police or military apparatuses, which is like you have a democratic level on a, on a nation state level, so to say, but then like within the apparatuses of the police, of the military, but also like I've been living, or you are, you, you are in Mexico now, I've been living in Mexico for a long time, so uh, you have like a privatization, you know, of, of massive violence against uh, popular populations, which is, um, of course, like the so-called uh, narco cart cart uh, it's called in, in English, yeah, the cartelists, yeah? uh, narco players. No? Um, and at the same time, I also must say, like, like this was, I think, like the panel where, um, where there was like most hope and most like uh, perspectives for struggle and for building alternatives also on this level, you know, it's also like everybody's like really wondering on, on a certain level. And when we are talking about these, um, impressive, massive, all powerful, seemingly all powerful actors, like whatever, you know, Erdogan, who can just put these people for lifelong prison or uh, our comrades from, from Russia who are like really, I don't know, we just have to wait that this guy dies and then we'll see what happens. And then here you could say, okay, also like political action, yeah, which is of course very clear what, what you said, Mariana, is like happening on this level and is in a very, very promising, no? I think um, what's happening there. So um, I just also wanted to ask you like for a reflection of this kind of rescaling of authoritarianism and, and resistance against it. Um, and then um, maybe just uh, the, the, the two questions that, that I have was uh, very concrete. One, like the relation that you see, um, I guess like it's a bit to all of you um, between the neoliberal transformations in the last, whatever, two or three decades, and um, something that, I don't know, we've been discussing it a lot with Isigur, the idea of like authoritarian neoliberalism within the state, if there's any qualitative break, if there's any like real difference, or if this is just like more of the same of what we've been seeing already, or if you see like that since whatever, maybe the crisis of 2008-9, there's been like a qualitative uh, change. And uh, to you, I wanted to ask, like, if you just edited this book, I, um, like, uh, how you see like the global comparability of the experiences? Is there like a kind of urban neoliberal authoritarian regime which, which is like very comparable, or do you see like um, big differences there? No. Because I just because of course, like when we talk about authoritarianism, very often on a national level, we have like the perspective: oh, it's not compared; it's so different. You know, like Modi is so different in the end from Trump. So no, but on this level, I felt that there may be like more connections. But I. Yeah. Okay, so hi. <laughs> I really I want to thank you all because it was a very amazing presentation. I feel like I've learned so much. <laughs> um, uh, I would like to ask a question uh, directly to you because I, I, you talked a lot about like Latin America. I come from Peru actually, and in Lima, the thing is like so. I really like this last graph. Sorry, I'm trying to organize my ideas, but <laughs> I really like this last graph that you shared. The circle with all the different like all this political agenda, which I thought was really really interesting and very comprehensive. Um, but I would like to ask you, what are the practical applications of this, considering I'm going uh, I'm gonna reference to my, my city, um, to Lima, for example. Uh, I believe that it would be um, essential to work in a community level at first, but we have, we don't also have the, we don't only have the problem from like authoritarian practices coming from the state, but there's also like the mafias that work um, with, um, with bases. And how can we, like combat that that like if people organize they can they have the fear that they lose their home or they can even be killed or um harassed until death um so that's why i, I just wanted to ask you like is, is there like a um what would be the practical applications for for people and how could it how people organize themselves despite all these threats that they could have from the the powers of the mafia um that work with um 
terrenos, I forgot how to say that, um, with like terrenos, <laughs> um, pieces, pieces of land, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank you very much. It was. <laughs> you can also sing. Okay, song. okay. <laughs> A political song, no? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no. Thank you very much. I will do it briefly. I don't want to <laughs> worry. <laughs> I promise. No, it, it was amazing. It was very, very interesting. Um, for Natalie, so I'm, I, I was thinking about a similar thing, how to conceptualize authoritarianism as a set of practices, more in a biopolitical level than like a, a state regime and so on. Uh, but for me, you know, like it's sometimes it's very, dif it's, it's very difficult so to differentiate how, so when like a, a, a set of practices um, are acting authoritarian or, or, or when not. For example, in the case of registration, so, I, I, so it, it's, a, it's a question. So, of course, it can be a way of control. It, it, it can be a, a way of, I don't know, like, a, yes, control, regulation of population and so on. But also can be a, a way of access to public services. And in that way, it's, 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 very, it's very problematic to consider itself, so registration, as an authoritarian practice in itself. So also, this is, I, I know, there is some kind of criteria what is something is is authoritarian or when something is like an access to a process of or to a kind of democratization. That's that's my idea. I, I have the question because I'm working in a similar in a similar like a way, but or more related to the workplaces, and sometimes it's very difficult for me to differentiate or conceptualize it right in, in that way. But thank you very much. I, I will waiting for your book. Yeah, really. um, and, and for for you, Mariana is so. I, I think that this is a very, very, very nice experience, the ride to the city, because you, you know, like, um, you could connect to a very different agenda or also narrative. It's not so the housing problem, it's also a problem that involves, I don't know, like women, migrants, and so, and you, you connected not also demands, but also narrative of life and narrative of experiences in the city, and uh, it was very, very interesting for me. But you mentioned that you for you socialization uh, socialization was like a, the legal tool let's say because it's in the constitution mm -hmm. but expropriation was the political tool because it's like more appealing to the people can, can you like uh, explain me a little more between these different and big why for example i don't know i come from latin america no, 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 exactly yeah. for, for, for me it's quite the opposite you know like if I, I think that socialization is more common it's more appealing that uh, expropriation that mean okay yeah you are like a violating the the, the say the private property and so on. So why, why here was uh, was the opposite? You know? Yeah, in Germany, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, just say something. Um, um, Lorena, sorry. Uh, Lorena, uh, that was uh, very interesting because, so you say like uh, we should like uh, reframe the um, this uh, dominating discourse of deficit and or like a lack of resources and i think that this is a very important tool because for example i know in argentina maybe not here but in argentina when you go to the media to talk about that so the first thing that or the first counter argument that come is the okay no so you will we create a deficit a public deficit we don't have resources if you like a put a limit to the you know to the to to, 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 to the rents, so you will be have uh, you will have uh, like a, a lack of uh, offer and so on, and I think that this is that is this technical question. Let's say technical, but they are like a very ideological, you know, like in, 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 in technical disguises. So are very important because you know, like a, you have to go to the media, and the media are like in Argentina at least the enemy. And so, how how, how do you think that? Um, that could be, so that kind of uh, ideological idea of deficit, lack of resources could be refrained. That is some, some ideas. But thank you very much. I think that was a very um, amazing panel. Faster. All right. Uh, so thank you for all of the all of the comments and questions. Um, 
Yeah. So, so where to start? Uh, I think the the maybe the the first question I'll start with is is this issue of what what is authoritarian and what isn't. Uh, so, as a geographer, we have a way of uh, geographers have a way of answering everything, which is it's contextual, um, which is to not really give a a, a a concrete answer. And I think this is this is actually why I, as a geographer, have wanted to to approach authoritarianism seriously because. So many geographers are just, they, they, they don't even want to touch the word because they understand that there's no essence to it. Um, and so then this sort of just gets given to political scientists who try to make some calculated list of all of the features. Uh, so, so this is also not satisfying. I, I think one, one of the definitions that I found particularly useful um, that I will just give a, a quick quote from is Simone de Beauvoir. And she, here she talks about freedom. Uh, so she says, to be free is not to have the power to do anything you like. It is to be able to surpass the given toward an open future. Uh, the existence of others as a freedom defines my situation as even the condition of my own freedom. So she talks about this idea of an open future. And, and I think to me, this is kind of what, what authoritarianism is working against that open future future that that's that's a, a, a rather simple approach to it but but I think this is gets to that issue of the the household registration system is not inherently authoritarian right so so in many cases you see the bureaucracy coming from the state as a way to control people but in a context like Germany yes it, it works that way not to the same extreme level as Kazakhstan Turkmenistan but the denial of access to that bureaucracy is then also in those contexts that becomes experienced as an authoritarian like yeah practice of exclusion and a denial of that freedom of that that open future that Du Beauvoir talks about right to be able to make a decision about how you're going to spend your money, how you're going to move through through space, how you're going to do all of these sort of things that we need to organize our daily existence, that's denied to people. Uh, so I think it's it's that how that practice then intersects with that possibility of an open future. Uh, to, to me, that's the, the simpler way of, of, of approaching it. And I think this also sort of comes back to the, the point that you made earlier, um, I, I think about like how, how we sort of see the scale at which these, these things are happening and, and the issue of the uh, yeah, forces of capital or neoliberalism that are participating in uh, securitization and the, the, the sort of, yeah, the, they're taking over of certain authoritarian practices. Um, I, I think about this a lot in the context of the United States, where I'm from. Does the sound go away? Yeah. We, we might have just killed oh. some batteries. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll try try this one. Uh, so I, I think in in the context of the United States, you see the growth of. I mean, we don't have so much like the the issue of the of the cartel violence, but we do see the rise of certain militia militia movements. Um, and and here again, these sort of grassroots groups are trying to use certain practices of violence to exert control on on various others. Uh, so in the U.S. Southwest, where I'm from, there's lots of indigenous groups who are opposing this through their own sort of approach to uh, to, to resisting these um, these militia groups, and you have these sort of competing uh, competing grassroots efforts. But one is is emphasizing violence, and they're emphasizing a closure of that freedom. And the other side, the indigenous groups in particular, and other sort of grassroots organizations, they're saying, "No, we are we are fighting to protect that open future and that like set of possibilities." Um, so yeah, I, I think in in a lot of ways, you you have that that competing issue, whether it's from the state or the grassroots. Um, lastly, to the point about uh, about the comparability, I, I mean, again, because I'm a geographer, <laughs> I'm inclined to think that everything is everything is comparable. And I've always sort of resisted anybody who tells me that you, you cannot put case studies side by side, because even when things look radically different, what often happens is it sheds light on your own assumptions about what you think is, quote unquote, normal. Right. Uh, so in the last years, I've been working a lot in the Arabian Peninsula in the countries where I work. 
in the United Arab Emirates in particular, only 10% of the population is a citizen. That means 90% of the population of the country is a non-citizen, does not have like the possibility of even becoming a citizen. So in a lot of ways, many people sort of look at that country and they say, oh, that's just strange, it's abnormal, it's, it's like you can't say anything about citizenship there. Well, in fact, you can because you, can, you, you see the, ab the assumptions that we have about citizenship and statehood and, and all of these other sort of political configurations in other countries that we think is normal. Normal, it's normal that migrants are excluded because they're a minority. Well, no, <laughs> that's not normal, it's not acceptable. Um, and then the conversations about voting rights then might look differently if we just reframe our assumption about what is quote unquote normal. So, so to me, I think any of these comparisons are useful. Um, in the book, there's, there's chapters from people from all, all around the world, um, whether it's Thailand or Northern Ireland or uh, Istanbul. I mean, there's, I think you'll see that there's a common thread and it's always useful to think through those, those comparisons. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I start with the, the question of, okay, expropriation, socialization. I, I, I agree with you because in the beginning I was with the same idea, like, why actually be thinking like a, like a Latin American? Of course. But at the same time, I think something that is really particular and I think is also very insightful is uh, we sometimes don't have the name of real estate companies, right? Who, who is the enemy? Who, who like, who, who, what is the problem exactly, you know? And when we have like, okay, so we need to, expropriation, uh, to expropriate something, you know? And when we have like this name, like Deutsche Bahn expropriation, uh, we, we, can, we can understand that, okay, this is a common fight, you know? You can like put people together uh, regarding a specific enemy, I think. So for me, this is like the difference, you know? Because, okay, socialization of housing, who is the responsible for that? Okay, state. So we are like fighting with the state. Uh, in the, uh, I don't know. For me, then like uh, understanding the, the context here and also like the relationship with uh, uh, socializ uh, socialism here and all, all the particular things. I think here makes sense, you know. And I also would like to add something about like a uh, right to the city and how, uh, right to housing. I may add, oh, <laughs> yeah. just because um, for me also like, okay, so here we are like discussing about voting rights. So discussing about like the right to participate in the city is, is different from the right to, to the city and is different from the uh, right to housing. And as you said about Lima, for example, 30% of people in Lima lives in, 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 the, in Las Variadas, the, uh, so in informal uh, spaces, right? So the right to, the, to housing in Latin America is really important. It's, it's different from like this discussion, right? So I think there are a lot of like, different perspectives in, in matters in this sense. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Super interesting comments and, and questions. Um, they're very complex. Uh, so uh, let me try to address some of those. Um, Maybe starting from this one, the right to housing and the right to the city. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning these two organizations. So the first one, the Habitat International Coalition, the focus of that one is actually housing rights and, and uh, land rights. Um, and through that, then getting into the right to the city. But that's the focus of the organizations working in that coalition. And the other one is for the right to the city. So we actually had that debate inside the organization for several years now. Inside the organization and also uh, within different actors and between different regions. So because in different regions, contexts are important, and not only because of the reality, but also because of the cultural tradition and the political traditions of organizing and claiming rights. Mm -hmm. So a lot of debates. Um, my personal take on this is that we, um, I don't think we should, we should uh, be facing like a, a final decision of, you know, and, and it's like a zero sum kind of game. So it's either that or the other one. And, and taking one implies leaving the other behind or, you know, forgetting about the other one. It's more like a combination. And of course, depends on the context and, and you know, what is relevant, f not even for that place, but for that place in that moment, because that can also change. 
Um, that being said, you also have the issue of, you know, right to housing is important, but also can be can be framed in that very, um, we, we, we should probably call the dictatorship of the economy, because we also live in the authoritarianismo, that is not only the military power and the police power, but it's the power of economics and economics understood in a very peculiar way. And these days, it's also algorithms. So it's not even mathematics. It's not even the financial power. It's algorithms. And that's a dictatorship. <laughs> this is actually you know, running through us. And our, it's commanding our lives, right? And it's, it's, it's foreclosing our, our freedoms, actually. Um, so basically, then you have just numbers and then you know, the dictatorship of numbers. And so how you get out of that is framing the problem of housing in bigger terms. Um, and that has a lot of components, but on the one hand, you could say, well, let's look at the empty spaces we have right now, both residential spaces, empty land, but also facilities and infrastructures we are not using, and let's uh, map that. So several movements for the right to housing and the right to the city <laughs> are doing that. And that's what we call, and based on, on of course, on um, you know, the work of Lefebvre, but going beyond that, and the city statute in Brazil and so on, the social function of land and property. And this is something that is in most constitutions all over the world, and actually is very, it's a principle that is very old, and you can find that in different religions, actually. So, um, and of course, the indigenous people, they have that, that the land, we should care for the land, and the land is not only for you know, human life, but we have a responsibility, and the most important value of that is how we use that and how we care for that. So the use value over the exchange value in Marxian terms. Um, so that's going to the core of the capitalist system and to the core of the private property and saying you cannot have empty houses at the same time that you have you know, rising homeless population and people needing a house. So mapping that and putting that at the center of the debate is very important. So we have several examples now, including some in Latin America, a policy in Montevideo and Uruguay, actually uh, focusing on some of those empty buildings, private buildings, because it's easier with the municipal buildings or state buildings, but in this case, it's um, private buildings. And the owners, they actually have a debt with the municipality. They have been paying their taxes for 20 years or more. So, you know, the value of the property is less than the debt they have with the municipality. So they just, you know, it's a requisition, right? So they just take uh, the, the property. They're trying to do that in Puerto Rico. Uh, of course, this is very difficult. And then you enter into the legal system. And we know that the legal system is not just money, you know, the economic part of capitalism that is based on private property. The legal system is also protecting private property above everything else. Um, so then it's very, it's a very difficult, even if you have the local government, you know, with the will to do that, you need to confront the legal system. But that is very important. And of course, then, a whole set of options of neighborhood improvement programs, housing improvement programs, so the qualitative deficit, not the quantitative deficit, uh, housing cooperatives, different forms of tenure, collective forms of tenures, and so on and so forth. So not only building more houses, and not only private property. So sometimes when, when you, fra you frame the discussion around housing rights, it gets confused with the right to property. So that's the other thing you need to disconnect. Right? So housing rights are not the right to property, and this is very important. And the, th the third one is that you need to unpack, and this is, this is connected with uh, both Natalie's and, and Mariana's inputs, you need to unpack the, the, you know, the, the legal registration of the place you live, and even having a legal address from the access to other rights. You cannot have the, you know, the, all those packed together and depending on that one. Because in many places, if you don't have an address, not even a property title, an address, if you cannot provide an address, you cannot access health services, education for you and your kids and your family and everything, right? Jobs, you name it, almost anything. And that's, that's discriminatory. So it's discrimination based on you know, property status or, or, or legal address. So how we unpack that, that's very, very important. And a lot of people have been working on that, including the former um, housing, UN housing rapporteur, that is an independent person, Raquel Ronick from Brazil, an amazing activist and, and uh, professor and everything else. Um, and she basically, we worked together, several organizations with her to, to do that, to unpack that, uh, the security of tenure, so beyond, be, beyond uh, the right to property and so on. Very, very important. 
Um, many of the questions about the connections between um, you know, neoliberalism and democracy, and Boris, you mentioned this, um, you know, take it down of, of authoritarianism and violence. Uh, I think that's, uh, of course, that's a burning issue. And not only in our region in Latin America, I think every, everywhere else. And that's part of another form of authoritarianism. It's not just coming through military or through a state power. It's actually violence. And that's connected with polarization and with algorithms and you know <laughs> all the things we know. But that form of violence, we, we saw that happening in Argentina very early on in the 90s, formerly the end of the dictatorship, a very weak democracy and so on. And then a huge, well, still a lot of power in the military and the police, but then a huge shift to private security. So former police and former military and a lot of money that was there then going to private companies. So it's not a coincidence that the, the big topic on the agenda in the 90s, and it's, it's back now, was security. So the, the only thing you heard in the news is security is really bad, insecurity is really bad, because that's kind of the deficit in housing. If security is bad, then you need more police and more guns, All right? So it's, um, it's, it's very, very complicated. And of course, uh, you know, the narco violence, but it's a lot of all of the forms of violence. And from a feminist point of view, that means a lot of men and a lot of young men with guns. Basically, you know, we, we don't care really if it's, you know, they're military, paramilitary, they're narcos, even community police. There are a lot of young men with guns. And, you know, we don't like that, right? A lot of us, including men, we don't like that. And that's actually foreclosure of freedom. I think that is brilliant. And, and that violence as, as the foreclosure of freedom. And, and that's why, you know, that the form of authoritarianism is, is so complex because it takes all, all those forms. But I think if we put it that way, it's very clear. And, and then you have communities like in, like in the US, you mentioned also in Mexico, in Acteal, uh, indigenous communities and the Zapatistas communities saying no to to the military, to the paramilitary, to the narcos, to the Coca-Cola, and you know, <laughs> that's the agenda. They have the agenda very clear there. And on the other hand, when you have the, the soup kitchens and community kitchens and talk, discussing about registration, those are open. And they, when you come, you know, you go there as a person needing food, they will not ask you, you live here and you're part of this community. You know, even if you look like a middle class person, they will not say this is not for you. They give food to everyone and they just trust the people need the food and they give it, right? So I think we have a lot of elements there to, to, to you know, discuss about this. And finally, I don't want you to forget your, your question and we can chat more about it. And I can certainly share the, the pie, um, the rainbow, rainbow pie. Um, well, there are a lot of elements there and those things, let me tell you, there are not just hope and, and you know, dreams and things that we like, we would like to see. They're happening. And some of those are happening, have been happening for a long time. And some of those are happening in a very connected and explicit way. So we can, we can discuss that more and provide more examples. Um, and you, you ask in particular about the mafias and the, and the difficulties of organizing at the neighborhood level in the, you know, popular neighborhoods because of the mafias. Uh, and of course, that also, that's also planted. There is undermining that level of organizing and so on. Um, I'm not very familiar with the situation in Lima, but I know that in Medellin, for example, and other places in Colombia, and also in Brazil, uh, that has been huge. And in Argentina, it's becoming a huge topic right now too. So the communities, they have their own tools to do that. And of course, it's difficult. And they have been fighting you know, um, and, and discussing a lot how to address this. And very difficult because it's very dangerous. Um, but they do have tools to do that, and, and you know, working with youth, working with different organizations within the neighborhoods and the community, and also with a lot of allies outside. And of course, providing opportunities for for young people and meaningful opportunities, you know, um, including job opportunities, of course, is is key. But I can I can also point out to some of those examples and and, and because it's different in, in every in every situation in every place, but they have managed to to do that in a way that in in, in Colombia for example they, they talk about not just peace but they talk about territorial peace and the importance of territorial peace and how to build peace from the bottom up from the territories up you know it's not enough that the government will sign this peace agreement with X X X. We need to build that at the community level. But also to think that this is it's not just happening because it's crime and you know some bad guys are doing bad things. 
this is organized uh, and very well organized. And it's actually a tool for, you know, disintegrating the social cohesion, not allowing other, other things to, to, you know, to happen at that level and, and expropriating things and appropriating things from people and so on. So, um, you know, it's, it's not as spontaneous and, and it's very well organized. And there's a lot of money behind that, a lot of money behind that. So. I think we also need more broader alliances between movements working on housing and right to the city struggles, but also with movements working, you know, on peace and other kind of human rights and yeah, conflict solutions and, and violence in general. Um, that's, you know, it's not my expertise, but uh, I know there are a lot of people thinking and, and, and working uh, around that. So we'll exchange emails and yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Uh, I'd like to share my experience. Um, so when I saw uh, Natalie share about the um, hukou system in China, um, so I I feel um, I would like to share my personal experience. The the my experience uh, under the uh, authoritarian state China. So um, first, I feel lucky to share my experience here. I will tell you. I will tell you why I feel lucky later. Um, I was born and raised in the migrant workers' um, family in China. So you know the hukou system. They divided the citizens into two two class: the urban urban hukou and the rural hukou. My parents are from the uh, rural area. And so in my city, uh, when I was in high school, in high school um, 10 years ago, uh, my parents have to pay the tuition fee per year around um, uh, 1,000 1, euro to, to support me. I, I, f I felt um, injustice at that time, although I don't know the concept about human rights or the rights to the city, rights to housing. Um, I, I asked my father. I asked my father why we have to pay for this. My father only told me, um, "I I I cannot complain. I cannot complain. I have to um, accept this to be more um, competitive to defeat my classmate and get the higher scores. Then I will be the winner." I think this the the way how the the authoritarian state the Chinese government to shape people's mind. Instead of um, let the people, um, let the people fight for their, um, fight for their right to to the city, um, the government told people to be more competitive, and to be the winner. I think it's like um, social Darwinism. So, is this the way? Is the way of the maybe of the of the government? And after after ten years now, I. I feel lucky to study at, at Germany at the Rugersburg University, and um, one year later, I sorry, one, one year before, I work uh, work in the community center in my city uh, to support the local community, the the parents and the children in this community. I still find uh, find it disappointed because the situation is still continuing on. The the parents. The uh, most of them are also migrant worker. They cannot have the um, local hukou in this city, in my city. Then, and their so their children have to leave um, after after graduation from after graduation from the primary school or middle school because they cannot pay for the tuition fee. It's so expensive. I think maybe it's still around one or two thousand uh, euro per year. So it's my personal experience. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I think, uh, do you have a question? Just go ahead. <laughs> it's on. Ah, okay. Um, no, it's, it's in the stream of precarization, and it's, it's shared with the precarization of work. You know, and okay, it was like a, you know, 
chance or accidentally that happened. But I think that the, there is in, in, in this way of how to frame the, the, the right to housing or how to frame the right to the city. So also to frame it in connection with the precarization of work because housing is one of the condition of workforce reproduction. So no, you, the, 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 the worker needs housing to live. So, and I think that the question of housing and the question of war are strongly connected, are, are very, very, very related. And sometimes like a housing, pro housing process and housing manifestation are also involved like a working, uh, working condition problems. So problem of working condition and so on. And you know, like, I don't you know, it's, it's, it's not just an idea, but it's, it's something to take into account. You know, that, that condition when you like, a, push for like a, for, 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 for better house condition or also for better working condition. So I think that this, uh, I, I was thinking of, of that. Yeah, just uh, because I was just remembering uh, uh, Dario Azzellini in the, in the work struggles panel, he just said, you know, like we don't have to think about worker struggles only happening in the workplace, but it's something that happens. Housing struggle is worker struggle. And like the concepts of housing struggle, class struggle and worker struggle are like separated, but it, it's not, you know, and the point of, okay, how, how is the, also the, like the, the question of, of, um, of exploitation, of expropriation of working classes happening. Like when, when uh, you, you, you shared the 100% increase in rents. What is this? Okay, it's like people who do not have property, you know, like paying the double to people who have property. So if this is not like class struggle, then what it is, no? And on this issue, I also uh, just about this the question of enteignen and Vergesellschaften or the expropriation and socialization. Because it's also um, like in, a, in, a, in the struggle perspective, it's, it's because I also and I would like assume, okay, it's, it cannot happen in Germany that you, yes, you expropriate and everybody's like for it and you have like 60% vote and so on. But of course, in the end, like it's the, probably the most successful um, canalization of class hatred, basically, you know, and, and, and really, like, and, and what's like captured by the far right as like resentment, like, um, which is called like, uh, um, what is like anger without an adversary, you know, they call it here, you know, this like, like, like this diffuse anger, which has nowhere to get to, which was what you said, you know, like the, we don't know like who's responsible, like everything is bad. So this is like this, this, um, resentment and, and hatred without an adversary, which is then canalized towards migrant population and so on. Like there's like a, a, a very, um, like, I think very positive, very interesting way of canalizing this um, to an addressee, but not an addressee which is like with a personality constructed, but like towards a structure, you know, which is of course very important, which uh, makes, makes a whole difference. And at the same time, like this concrete possibility, and this is also because like the, the big struggles here are like the questions around care and about housing, yeah? like the concrete question of relating to actual living conditions um, and the possibility to create actual alternatives is what um, Lorena was also speaking about, you know, like the, um, the possibility of like creating like this small other worlds. No? I think this is uh, also very, very, very good connection to this. Yeah. Would you like to add on that? No? no? Well, okay, and then I will be just adding uh, one last thing and in, in terms of just taking out from the resistance and canalizing that and uh, just share something from the gentrification scholars where they wanted to resist gentrification that they are trying to go into this everyday acts of resistance. And I think I was thinking about it yesterday when we were on the boat as well, because uh, any, every kind of resistance doesn't have to be this loud protests or uprisings or legal battles, but the fact that we existed on that boat uh, yesterday in an area that we were not really wanted or supposed to be in a self-made boat that was really uh gentrifying quite fast was an act of resistance actually and I think that's important in terms of geography and in terms of uh, resisting against this kind of exclusionary practices as well so thank you very much for all the panelists and thanks a lot for coming thank you